what we're going to talk about is a dessert that actually changed the world. So how many of you know the original use of agar? Anyone familiar with that story? Um, I brought a little sample up here. Um, agar is an integral part of the um, diet in uh, Asian countries. And so uh, Fanny Hess had an interesting connection to agar. And so I went and picked up a little bit of uh, food grade agar to share. So if you want to pass this around, um, you can take a look at that. All right, so how did this simple um, food staple from Asia change the world? Okay, how many of us use agar and agaros in our research? Okay. And so despite all of the knowing and using it, but not everybody knows where it came from. And so again, that's why we're trying to tell this story. So how about some of these other things? How many of you with these have heard of a Petri dish? Okay. How many have heard of an Erlenmeyer flask, a uh, Bunsen burner? These are all integral parts of our research as microbiologists that have names associated with Petri and Erlenmeyer and Bunsen. But no, they weren't the ones that necessarily invented these. They modified it. That's the name that's been stuck with it. But why is this this integral element of agar? Why is this not as well known who that person is that's behind introducing that into the, um, into the discipline? So I'm here to tell you about Fanny Hess and her story. So her uh, maiden name, Angelina Fanny Elsmus. Um, Fanny Hess, that's her married name. She married Walter Hess, um, a, a German MD who was interested in environmental um, factors that influenced health. And so uh, Fanny Hess grew up in the US. She grew up in New York. Um, her family is of Dutch descent, so many of her relatives had lived in the uh, Dutch West Indies. So she learned about cooking with agar, and agar was used in these environments because of the heat. You know, um, gelatin doesn't really hold its, um, its structure very well at higher temperatures, and so agar has a much better retention at the, at the higher temperatures in Southeast Asia. And so she learned how to cook with, with agar and took it with her when she moved to Germany with her husband. All right. And so her husband went on to work in Robert Koch's lab, and that's how Fanny played a critical role in introducing agar into our microbiology discipline. Okay, so Fanny was, again, around these scientists, and they were frustrated. Early days of microbiology, they were culturing microbes on potato slices, and they were using gelatin, but it wasn't working very well because to grow some of these disease-causing microbes that grow at body temperature, the gelatin just didn't work very well. And so Fanny, because of her experience working with agar, said, hey, why don't you try this as a solidifying agent rather than uh, the gelatin we're using, and of course then history follows that, and so steadily um, agar took its uh, role in society. So how do we get this message out? So there have been some stories in ASM Press trying to tell the story of Fanny Hess and her husband Walter and their role in this um, phenomenal discovery. So back in actually 1939, there was a paper in Journal of Bacteriology talking about it, um, and actually they tried to promote using calling, calling agar Hess Media. Um, didn't really kind of catch on with the, with the population, but they actually were the first ones to propose this idea of associating that name with the, with the agar. And then more recently, 1992, if we can call that recently, um, the grandson of Walter and Fanny uh, wrote an article in ASM News. And so some of the graphics that Fanny made the cover of ASM News and the grandson told the story about how they played this important role in the discovery and introduction of agar into the microbiology discipline. So this awareness still didn't really catch on. And not surprisingly, um, Corrado did a survey of Anybody that would take this survey, and even among microbiologists, more than half of the population were not aware of who Fanny Hess was and her contributions. Yet more than half of them knew about Petri. So why this disconnect? Why isn't Fanny getting the credit that she, she's due? And so this is a bit surprising to me. I said, that can't possibly be. I mean, I learned about Fanny. I've been talking about Fanny in, in my classes my entire career. Why is that the case? And so interestingly, of course, you know, we all get those textbooks from the publishers to use this textbook in your classroom. And so I went through the textbooks I have. Half the textbooks that I have don't even mention Fanny Hess. And when they do mention it, the stories vary all over the place, anywhere from Fanny Hess was an, a neighbor of Robert Koch, and Robert Koch went over and had dinner at her house and saw her cooking with agar and said, oh, I should use that in my media. Or he would go visit 
the Hesses. He was, he was, the, um, Walter and Fanny worked in his lab, so they would go to their house for dinner. And again, Koch came up with the idea, saw her cooking with Agra and said, oh, um, that's a great idea. I'm going to use this. And so that misconception is being perpetuated through even our textbooks. So how do we really show that Fanny was an integral part, a scientist contributing to the work being done in Robert Koch's lab. And so from this, um, colleague Corrado Nye um, followed up on the grandson's article in ASM News. Um, in that article, the grandson referenced that they have some of her papers. And so he actually went ahead and said, okay, what are those papers? What's in there? And so he actually reached out to the family and they were delighted to know somebody was interested in their story. And so from that, he's now written an article that's in Smithsonian. He's working on a, submitting a published article that should be coming out um, hopefully uh, by the end of the year, but trying to tell her story um, more broadly so that people really understand her contribution because what he learned from these papers, from these documents that they have is that Fanny wasn't just a housewife, wasn't just a neighbor. She was a person that worked in the lab. This is her artwork. She took the research that we were doing. She was the illustrator of all their work. So she has all this work from unpublished manuscripts from the Koch lab. And so this is showing that she wasn't just a passive participant. She was in the lab. And her credit really belongs to her contribution of coming up with this idea, sharing it with the Cox and producing it. And then to further the story that it's really her idea and she's the one that's really been promoting it, even Koch himself, if you read his paper on tuberculosis, read some of his other work, even he doesn't really catch on to using Agra till much later in his, in his career. And so she really did bring it along and then it just took a little while for that to really catch on and, and tell the story. So that's what we're trying to do is to um, illustrate and solidify her role. And so what Corrado's done with this information now is realizing we need to tell her story a little bit more. So he and a group of colleagues have been working on creating a graphic novel. And this is how I got introduced. Honestly, um, I mean, I've known about Fanny. I've been telling this story. But um, once I saw that, that uh, Corrado and his colleagues were trying to promote this through a Kickstarter campaign, um, I immediately contributed to that. And it's been communicating with Corrado um, and kind of got drawn into this opportunity to really tell her story um, as well as we can. So, uh, so Corrado has now got this... Um, uh, um, graphic novel in the works with some really brilliant artists. The artwork for this is really um, fantastic. Um, and now it's in a Patreon campaign, so they're trying to, again, raise funding. They have a, an editor. I believe they now have a publisher looking at it. So now how do we get this story out there um, and told? So that's the, the story we're trying to make. And I think this is a great example. This session here um, is all about really promoting these, these untold stories, these significant stories in the sciences and the important role of archives like Choma, the history of microbiology, um, the uh, Robert Koch Institute, uh, which also is affiliated with the Humboldt University. So the role of these kinds of archives in keeping and telling that story is critical and how we can partner. So Corrado working with, with, uh, with the Robert Koch Institute, Shoma working with, with, with Corrado, um, we can build this great story to really tell the story in a very robust and meaningful full way. So that's our story. Um, and Today actually is Fanny's 175th birthday, and so a uh, quick microbial toast to Fanny Angelija Hest. Hopefully this gets you a little bit more interested in following up and seeing what she does, but also other scientists that are not getting the credit they use. When you hear about and read about some of the scientists out there, um, get the word out. You know, go and visit. What can we do to improve that? And reach out to our, our Shoma um, folks and say, we need to tell this story. So thank you all for attending and uh, your attention. Thank you.